his eyes were dead. Um, his eyes had no spark of life, had no um, humanity in them. There was something wrong with the guy. And I don't mean psychologically, I mean in his creation. Evil walks amongst us. Don't kid yourself. It comes calling when you least expect it. They were small females that he could easily manhandle. Some of them he would be able to pick them up by the throat, get their feet off the ground where they couldn't fight him. I had a front row seat to evil during 30 years of investigative reporting. I'm Robert Riggs. I created True Crime Reporter to tell the backstory of cases you may never have heard of before. Austin had never had torture, kidnapping, torture, brutalization uh, by a serial sexual sadist. I pulled out my reporter's notebooks. My law enforcement sources opened up their case files. We sat down to talk, and you can listen to our journey into darkness. I've dealt with serial rapists and murderers and, and all sorts of people, but this guy was just a sexually sadistic killer that had no conscience and was a true sociopath. Be advised that this podcast is for a mature audience and not for the faint of heart. Some episodes may contain profanity and graphic details of violent crimes. To follow True Crime Reporter, text True Crime to 33777. Text True Crime, that's two words, True Crime to 33777. With that said, here we go on another journey into darkness. On November 16, 1998, guards on Texas death row at the Alice Prison Unit moved serial killer Kenneth McDuff to a new cell. They put McDuff on death watch 36 hours before his execution. Every half hour, guards recorded his behavior and mood in a death row log. They noted that McDuff was sleepless and intense. McDuff had confidently expected to receive a stay of execution, but was shocked when he did not. McDuff told guards that he wanted to be remembered as a notorious serial killer. Armed guards move serial killer Kenneth Allen McDuff off death row at the Ellis Prison Unit on the morning of November 17, 1998. They locked the 51-year-old killer in a cage inside a prison van and shackled him to restraints. Guards told me he was docile and joking. McDuff had tried to smuggle heroin into death row to administer his own lethal injection. He wanted to control the end of his life, just as he got a rush from controlling the end of his victims' lives. The prison gate swung open for the 12-mile drive south on Farm to Market Road 980 to downtown Huntsville, Texas. They headed to the Texas State Penitentiary, nicknamed the Walls Unit. The Walls Unit is the site of the Texas Death House. The massive red brick walled prison opened in 1849. It's located a few blocks off the town square and covers 54 acres. Texas releases all of its prisoners from the Walls Unit. McDuff had walked out of here on parole nine years earlier. This time, he would leave in a pine box made by fellow inmates. 32 years of evading the death penalty for murdering three Fort Worth teenagers was coming to an end. The Walls Unit main entrance leads into a three-story red brick administration building with bars on its windows. Closely trimmed hedges attended to by inmate trustees line the front steps. An old-style clock with a white face and black hour and second hands is the focal point on the building's facade. During executions, all eyes turn to the clock at the stroke of 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Texas law specifies that all executions are to be carried out at or after 6 p.m. Huntsville time. At the back entrance to the death house, guards escorted McDuff down a sidewalk lined with yellow roses planted and tended to by inmate trustees. 
Inside, guards conducted a cavity search. They locked McDuff in a small holding cell painted white. It contained a thin mattress that rested on a steel backboard, a metal toilet, and a small corner sink, all made by inmates in Texas prison factories. John Moriarty, who had been on McDuff's case for six years, made one last attempt to get McDuff to confess the location of the bodies of more than a dozen other women. McDuff asked for a cigarette. None of the officers smoked. No one had a lighter. Moriarty recalls how McDuff pulled out a lighter hidden in his clock. He reached into this item that he had in his property and pulled out a lighter, which was contraband in the prison system, and lit the cigarette that he was smoking. And uh, On death row? In the, in the death chamber. Oh, my gosh. In the cells adjacent to uh-huh. the death, but in the death house. Well, it shows you how cunning they are. Exactly. They, they adjust to whatever the environment is and adapt. Outside the cell, two telephones and a Bible sat on top of a small table covered with a white starch tablecloth. McDuff's last meal would be served here. He requested two 16-ounce T-bone steaks, five fried eggs, vegetables, french fries, coconut pie, and a can of Coca-Cola. The prison served McDuff the same meal every inmate received that day. No one gets T-bone steak or special meal requests behind bars in Texas. Thinking about the hereafter, McDuff told Moriarty that he didn't want to sing hymns from some hilltop in heaven. He wanted to go someplace he could party. Outside the walls unit, the usual anti-death penalty protesters with their picket signs were noticeably absent. John Moriarty witnessed McDuff's execution and fills in more details. There are two viewing rooms uh, and, a, and the drug room. Uh, as well as the actual execution uh, chamber where the condemned is, is brought in and, and strapped down. And there's a, a large team of individuals, uh, the correctional officers that are there that escort the individual. People always used to ask me, well, uh, do, do you, uh, I mean, don't, you, don't they have to fight? Uh, a lot of these guys into the chamber. I know if it was me, I, I mean, I would kicking and screaming. I'd be kicking and screaming. But you know, um, uh, these guys are. Uh, I, I can count on one hand the number of times that they were. People either had to be uh, one one case where an individual had to be fought in, uh, and and put in there. But um, the other case, I mean, I, I know there was one where the guy said, "My my legs just won't carry me." Yeah. And they picked them up and put them in there. But um, anyway, um, they're passive. They're passive, and and they um, it goes back to believe it or not, uh, looking good to the other boys on death row. That you know you want to go out like a man, and so they walk in and they lay down, and um, you know. So anyway, so he he walks in and lays down. Shortly after 6 p.m., five guards escorted McDuff on his final walk through a steel door into the death chamber. They placed McDuff on his back atop a gurney tightly covered by a white starch sheet. They strapped him down with six thick, wide, tan-colored belts across his ankles, lower legs, thighs, waist, and chest. Next, the guards strapped McDuff's arms to armrest that swung out at an angle from each side of the gurney. Then they left the chamber. The execution team entered from an adjoining room where they operate the lethal injection apparatus. They inserted IVs into each of McDuff's arms. One IV is a backup. They tightly wrapped the entire length of McDuff's arms and hands with ACE bandages. This is to prevent the condemned inmate from making an obscene gesture to the victim's family witnessing the execution. Guards escorted witnesses separately into two different rooms, one for the condemned family, one for the victim's family. 
McDuff's daughter from a rape who you heard about concerning bribery allegations in an earlier episode and a nephew were his witnesses. Family members of four of McDuff's victims, law officers, and media representatives watched from the other room. Parnell McNamara, the deputy U.S. Marshal who started the original manhunt for the serial killer, describes the scene inside the victim's viewing room. Yes, and Mr. and Mrs. Brand, who he had killed their son, Robert Brand, in 1966. So it's a small room. I think it holds maybe 12, 15 people max. And the the criminal's family's on the other side of the wall. You can't see them. But when we went in there, he was already on the gurney. He was strapped down. And so I'm on the front row standing next to the glass. And they've got this microphone that comes down right in front of their face in case they want to say something. And Mr. and Ms. Brown were behind me. And I turned around to them and I said, y'all need to be on the front row. So I moved them and put them in front of me uh, waiting on the execution. The prison chaplain stood at the foot of the gurney with his hand on McDuff's right leg. The prison warden stood at the right side of McDuff's head. Moriarty fills in more details. During the execution, the warden is in there and the chaplain. The chaplain is the only person allowed to touch the inmate. And he usually has, and in this case, he did have his have his hand on his leg. And um, But that's the, the, the scenario. And at that time, the, um, the warden has a, you know, the last words, ask him, you know, do you have anything you need to say? The warden gave McDuff two minutes to answer. A microphone suspended from the ceiling transmits the last words into each of the viewing rooms. At 6.18 p.m., McDuff said, I am ready to be released. Released me. All of us were puzzled by McDuff's last words. Moriarty explains. What did that mean in prison terms? Well, obviously, he'd spent quite a bit of his life locked up, and and uh, he just uh, wanted to go. A lot, of, a lot, of, I wanted to get out and be free from being locked up. But you know, the um, a lot of the guys they say something religious, or you know, they have an old saying around the penitentiary that Jesus Christ must certainly live in a penitentiary because everybody finds him when they get there. That's really true for people that are on death row but when you're a sociopath uh, or psychopath you um, it doesn't matter to you because it's all about you when mcduff finished his last words i am ready to be released release me the execution team released a lethal dose of chemicals into mcduff's iv the serial killer let out a few brief gasps of air and exhaled a long breath Officials pronounced McDuff dead at 6.26 p.m. Parnell McNamara continues his description. And he said, I'm ready to be released. Release me. And that's all he said. And so they basically shot the juice to him. And, uh, of course, like any execution, uh, he made some sounds and then he expired, they declared him dead, and then he turned blue. And Mr. Brand turned around and grabbed me by the arms, and he shook me and he said, I've been waiting for this for over 30 years. And he was crying, and I said, you shouldn't have had to wait 30 years for this. And so what a sense of relief and we walked out of there. I knew that dirty, low-life scumbag, piece of gutter trash would never hurt anybody else on this earth. And so, uh, you know, they call you after you witness an execution. I don't know if they still do it, but they used to call you and see if you were traumatized. And I said, the, I told them, quit calling me. I'm fine, you know. I'm not, I was never traumatized by the execution. I was traumatized by what I found out he did to the victims. That's what traumatized me. So you don't need to call me anymore. 
I'm okay. Afterward, Brenda Solomon, the mother of Melissa Northrup, told me, quote, my children are going to rest in peace now, and McDuff is going where he needs to go. I want y'all all to know I am very glad this is over with. My children are going to rest in peace now, and he's going where he needs to go. Family members of Robert Brand, one of the three teenagers that McDuff murdered in 1966, had waited for 32 years for this execution. Cindy Easley, the daughter of Robert Brand's sister, was two years old at the time of his murder. She said her mother was never the same afterwards. I was two years old when this happened. I, I don't have any memories of my family. That's what he took away from me. My mother loved her brother dearly, and she was never the same after that. Laurie Bible, the sister of Colleen Reed, chose not to witness McDuff's execution. Afterward, she said, quote, What was important to me was that the death sentence be carried out and that he be executed and that he never have the opportunity to hurt another person on this earth. Darren Moore, the brother of Regina Moore, whose mother had confronted McDuff after she disappeared, said, quote, It's finished for him but it still goes on for all of us. Author Gary Laverne witnessed McDuff's execution. One of the things about um, the death penalty is that um, a lot of times people will say that it, it gives you closure. And, and that's not completely true. It's true about some things. For example, Colleen Reed's family, now they don't have to go to any more parole he- hearings. Not, not for McDuff, maybe for Worley, but not for McDuff. So in that respect, you know, the, the death penalty provided closure. They don't have to see him again. They don't have to hear from him again. They don't have to hear from nuts who contact them, who say that McDuff is really innocent. You know, and, and all, of these, all of these families have had to go through that kind of cruelty, really. Um, But it doesn't provide closure uh, insofar as these are not things that you can forget. Colleen's the one that you remember and um, and, and miss every Christmas, every Thanksgiving. And um, so what, what I see when I visited those families of those victims, and I did for just about all of them. I I see pain that lingers, I'm sure, to this day. And when I think of Colleen, you know, I don't see the petite, vivacious accountant, excited and all that you heard about. I always see that's the suffering that I read about in Worley's confession. In Worley's confession. And, um, you know, I would, when, when her body was finally recovered, and uh, and you see that the the skeleton, her remains, you know, I I didn't. It it wasn't my first reaction to say, well, she's finally at peace. I, that wasn't my reaction. My reaction was, what must her last hours have been like at the hands of that guy? Then Falls County Sheriff Larry Pamplin also witnessed McDuff's execution. He still regrets not pulling the trigger when he and his father confronted McDuff at gunpoint in Vermont, Texas, when they pursued him for the 1966 murders. Got a parole system, and it should be fair and honest, and these individuals should be kept incarcerated that are a danger to the society. And McDuff, like I said, there's no telling how many people he's actually killed uh parnell and i have sat around and talked about it several times and the best we could come up with somewhere between 22 25 people but stop and think how many lives that has destroyed besides the person that died I mean, the mother, the father, the sisters, the brothers, the aunts, the uncles. Uh, 
it's just a crying shame that we could not have eliminated the source in Bremont, Texas, because, my God, it'd be a lot more people living. When news of Macduff's execution reached his hometown of Rosebud, where he was known as the feared town bully, and his mother the pistol-packing, doting mama, residents felt a sense of relief. They also made it clear in no uncertain terms Rosebud would not be Macduff's final resting place. A few days passed. No one from Macduff's family claimed his body. Inmates put Macduff's corpse into a wood casket made by inmates. A crew of inmates dug Macduff's grave in the red dirt, 22-acre Captain Joe Bird Prison Cemetery located a mile from the Walls Unit. Bird was a former assistant warden who oversaw maintenance of the cemetery. Inmates called the cemetery Peckerwood Hill, a disparaging term for white racist inmates as well as poor white inmates. A chaplain, according to procedure, said grace. The crew of inmates covered his grave and put a nameless headstone in place. The inscription notes Macduff's date of execution, November 17, 1998, and an X signifies that the nameless person buried here was executed by the state of Texas, and it contains Macduff's death row number, 999055. Macduff went down in Texas history as the only inmate to have had two death row numbers as well as its most sadistic sexual serial killer ever. Bill Johnston, the former U.S. attorney who pulled out all the stops to catch McDuff and to find his victims' bodies, passed on witnessing the execution. Johnston admits that he is not an advocate for the death penalty, but in the Kenneth McDuff case, he believes there was no alternative. You know, I'm not an advocate for the death penalty in every case that it's available necessarily. <clears throat> that sounds weird from a prosecutor, but I think you'd be so careful about it. But if there is a case where the death penalty could have saved lives, could have prohibited wonderful innocent people from being tortured and killed, this was the case. And so I think that the way the Court of Appeals saw this thing and the way the public saw it was, this is a wild rabid animal that must be put down and to me Macduff was more animal than human he was the worst of humanity and there was no safe thing to do with that thing that creature other than kill it to this day author Gary Laverne wonders if Macduff could have provided a living specimen for the scientific study of serial killers I couldn't help but wonder the scientist in me uh, meant that I couldn't help but wonder if we had not just destroyed the Rosetta Stone of of uh, serial killing. The what I mean what I mean by that is that maybe if we had studied him more carefully, we would have uncovered something that might, as remote as that sound, might reveal why these people exist. I don't know why people like that exist. Don't get me wrong, I didn't share a tear, shed a tear for Kenneth McDuff, and I think the death penalty in this case was justice. But if he, if studying him and that wicked brain of his would have uncovered anything of value, well, it's not possible now. He's dead and buried in Peckerwood Hill, and I guess that's where he belongs. Next on True Crime Reporter, the McDuff parole scandal brings sweeping changes to the Texas criminal justice system. And we discuss what are the lessons for today. You hate to think about this. Um, Someone asked me about an area of Mexico recently and they said, is it safe to go there? And I said, it's perfectly safe until you're kidnapped or murdered. And then it's not. So it's really not fun for people to think, gosh, I can go out to the bars in Dallas until one in the morning, nothing's going to happen to me. And they get home and they're perfectly safe. That was perfectly safe what they just did. The problem is that there are some people out there. I hope there's not an exact McDuff, 
but there are people out there that have such a disregard for life that you almost need to you don't want to be in fear, but you want to be prepared because, you know, the rabbit in the field doesn't know there's a hawk diving on him. It just dives on him and bang, it has him. And there's nothing you can do. Aren't you glad it's not a crime to love reality TV? Hey, true crime lovers, this is Shannon, one of the researchers for this podcast. Paper Chaser Paper Goods is your go to spot for all of your reality TV obsessions. Check out paperchaserpaper.com and channel your love of the Real Housewives with Paper Chaser's reality TV-themed gifts. From cocktail napkins to Bravo TV-themed imitations, Paper Chaser has everything you need to host happy hour at your place and be the it girl of your inner circle. Now remember, it's not a crime to love reality TV. Paper Chaser believes life's a party, so celebrate something every day. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram for the latest Paper Chaser in reality TV scoop. We'll see you on paperchaserpaper.com. True Crime Reporter is a trademarked and copyrighted news show. It is an original co-production with podcast ad reps. Hosted and written by me, Robert Riggs. Executive producer, Elizabeth Arnold. Audio production by Matt Stoker. Original music by Blair King. Associate producer, Siler Burr. Social media producer, Grace Woodward. Publicity, Tim Livingston, PR. Photography, Igor Kurgulats. Graphics, Brian David Kerr Designs. Special thanks to Gary Laverne, author of Bad Boy from Rosebud, The Murderous Life of Kenneth Allen McDuff. The audio recordings of the Senate Criminal Justice Committee hearings are courtesy of the Texas State Archives. Archive sound bites included in the episodes are from my original Reporter's Notebook tape recordings. And for our listeners who stayed to hear the credits, here's a little bonus. Well, uh, one of the, my, my own friend, Bad Boy from Rosebud, was easily, by far, the most difficult book I've ever had to write because uh, there are two chapters in that book involving Colleen and involving the three kids that McDuff killed in 1966 that are just about as horrifying as anything, fiction or nonfiction that you can read, and and I know you've read my book many times, and I'd be surprised if you didn't agree with this. The chapter on the car wash of what he did to Colleen, I have many, many of my friends who tell me and who know me well that they can't believe I wrote such a thing. And the reason I did is because I had, quite frankly, painted myself into a corner. I, when I finally appreciated the extent of his horror and his brutality and his sheer sadism, uh, I could either sugarcoat it or I could tell the brutal truth and I decided to tell the brutal truth. So when it comes to Macduff, there's not an off, there's, there's nothing of consequence that you can't find out about the extent of his cruelty. Uh, if you read the book, you'll, you'll find out exactly what kind of person he was. And it's just unthinkable. I, as a seasoned yeah. journalist, war zones, yeah. and, you, and I've seen all kinds of horrible things happen to people. When I read that Whirly Confession, mm-hmm. that was unthinkable. You couldn't. Fiction could do It's this. something you can't get out of your mind. No, you cannot. Uh, mm. To this day, you know, I think of Colleen. I, I had a special kind of, I didn't know Colleen Reed. I've come to know her sister, Lori Bible, quite well. It turns out that Colleen Reed and Lori Bible grew up as Cajuns in Louisiana. And we grew up about 40 miles from one another. I didn't know them, but... Um, but we grew up, and so when I had a special bond and relationship with Lori Bible because we came from Cajun, Louisiana, and um, and that added to the horror to me because I just can't imagine uh, a good Cajun girl from Evangeline Parish, Louisiana, 
uh, going through something like that. that that's foreign to how we grew up and where we're from.